uh, when our uh, little Yorkshire Terrier died, uh, we really did miss him. When my dad died, it was as if the world would never be the same. Probably the same with you, you know. Um, because the dog uh, was dear to us, but detached. Your dad or your mum are kind of part of you. Uh, so you feel it as part of yourself. Uh, God made dogs and rivers. But you are not a dog or a river. To some extent, the dogs and rivers are detached from him. They're things, creatures that he has made, but they're not part of him. When he made you, he made you part of his own son. He made you part of himself. He gave you his own life. He gave you his own heart. He opened his own home to you. And so you are part of him. And he feels the same way about you as we would about our fathers or our mothers. He opened himself actually to be hurt by you because he gave you free will. Free will to accept him or to reject him. And when he did that, of course, I don't know that you've maybe thought this far, but he gave you and had to give you the freedom to crucify him. That's what giving free will necessitated. He had to be prepared to accept the worst that you would do to him. We tend to think of him as the one who weak creatures. But when you think about it, if he was really going to give us free will, he had to give us free will to do what we wanted, even if that meant to crucify him. And he had to be prepared to take the worst that we could do to him. And that, that's what we were really talking about last week, when we said that in him, in Jesus, we had redemption through his blood. Part of the cost and the responsibility that God accepted when he made us in his own son and gave us his own life and made us part of his own home, and gave us free will like his own. Part of that involved at that same moment being prepared to allow us to do the very worst that we could do to him. And of course that meant, if necessary, destroying him. And if that was all he could have done, well, that would have been the end of everything for all of us, including him. And so he had his own son and asked him to take that destruction. But he himself 
in his son, in the world to himself, bearing that destruction. It's just that he was all still the father, therefore to raise the son. But he couldn't raise him without raising us also. And he raised us up with him. So when we talk about redemption through his blood, we're talking about the thing that was necessary for God being who he is to make free will agents like us. He had of necessity to bear the worst that we would do. In other words, he is not the kind of God who can allow us to march through the world murdering and destroying. He himself has to be inside that person that we destroy. He himself has to be in his son, in every person that died in misery in the concentration camp. He has to be the little guy in your school that you spoke to so cruelly that he felt just that size. He had to, in his son, be in that little fellow. He had to bear the worst that the people whom he made could do if he were to be true to himself, because he is not the kind of God who can make the rivers and just let them go, make the people and just let them go and do what they want. He, of necessity, has to bear the worst that they could do. And that's what he did. And so when we talk, as we did last Sunday, about redemption through his blood, we're talking about the fact that not only was Christ bearing the worst that we could do to him and his Father, but then in a deeper way also, or in as deep a way, he was us bearing the just wrath of his Father upon mankind. So Christ was both God and man at that moment. He was God bearing the dreadful things that we have done to him because, as Jesus said, if you give somebody a cup of water in my name, you do it unto me. Then when you give somebody uh, a cut across the face or you give somebody uh, a cruel word, you similarly give it to Christ and therefore to God. So Christ was not only God bearing the worst of our sins, but he was also us because he is all of us. We were all created inside him. So he is us also bearing the destruction that God had to work upon that evil. And it's because of that that it's possible to talk about redemption through his blood. Now, it's good for us to see that that is what had to happen if God were to do what he all along wanted to do. God, because of his mercy and his loving heart, all along wanted to forgive us. But he could not unless all those things that we talked about were satisfied. All those were involved. That's why we talk about that as atonement. Somebody has said, you know, it's at one moment. It's the bringing into at one moment of God and man. That's what happened, not just on Calvary, but as we know, in the heart of God, when the Lamb was slain from before the foundation of the world. That's where God faced all that was involved in giving us free will. He had to drink to the dregs everything 
the very worst that we could do to him. And we had to drink to the dregs the very worst or the just thing that he had to do to us. We drank neither. We drank neither. Our elder brother stepped forward for us and drank it. And that's what we call redemption or the atonement. And that's universal. That's for everyone. The atonement has taken place for every man and woman that has ever lived or that will ever live. All of us were in Christ in that atonement. And that's what we talked about last day. Today, we talk about the second half of the verse, which is something that is conditional upon repentance and faith. But it's something that is possible only in the light of the atonement. In other words, God could not forgive unless all that were dealt with. Put it this way, if he had forgiven and all that was not dealt with, he would have been pretending. And he would no longer be the God of purity and love and justice. And he would no longer have human beings who had free wills, who could enter into a loving fellowship with him. The whole plan would be right then destroyed, because he would simply be indulging us in what we wanted to do, and there would be no reconciliation, there would be no coming together of him in his reality and us in our reality. I've often said to you, we need to be honest with each other. We need to be real with each other. We need to say what we really think to each other. That's partly because that's what God is. God is real and true. He cannot, he cannot act against his own nature or apart from his own nature. And so all that was needed. Now what we come to today is what is called the forgiveness of sins. So if you look at, uh, it's Ephesians chapter 1, and it's that verse 7. Ephesians 1 and verse 7b. Remember the way it reads Ephesians 1 and 7a is what we talked about last day, the universal atonement. In him we have redemption through his blood. We are bought back through his blood, through his death. And then, secondly, we have the forgiveness of our trespasses the forgiveness of our trespasses. And so that is concerned with our response to the work of redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses. It's interesting that the word there for forgiveness is not this word. And uh, in English transliteration, that, that would be P-A-R-E-S-I-S. -S. It's not paresis. That is the word that you find in Romans 3 and 25. You might glance at that, Romans 3 and 25. Part of what we read as a New Testament lesson Romans 3 and 25, page 979. Whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Passed over is the meaning of the word paresis. It means overlooking. You remember there's a, another verse that, that talks about God winking. It isn't quite 
the same as that, because that is concerned with a time of innocence when men didn't even know what was wrong. But overlooking applies to those who know the law in the Old Testament and who disobeyed. And God overlooked their sin. That's what paresis is. Or it's similar to the word Passover. It's a Passover or a passing over their sins. Why? Because the blood of the lambs and the blood of the cattle that were sacrificed in the Old Testament were simply symbols of the actual death of us in Christ that took place in the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And so the Old Testament people did not really know clearly that that had happened. They simply knew that the blood of the sacrifices stood for something, and often they would think, well, that pleased God. But because Christ had not yet been proclaimed clearly to them, he was able, God was able only to pass over their sins. He overlooked them. Much, you remember, as the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. He passed over. He overlooked them. So, in some sense, the Old Testament people never really did experience forgiveness. They experienced an overlooking of their sins. From time to time, you find men like David who seemed to experience the reality of the Lamb that was slain through a supernatural revelation of the Holy Spirit. But the bulk of mankind experienced what Romans 3 and 25 calls the overlooking or the passing over of the sins. Now, that's not the word that is used here. The word that is used, if you look back at Ephesians 1 and at verse 7b, the word for forgiveness in a way looks a little like that at the end of it. The last four letters are the same, but it's called aphasis. And it's the same thing as happened, you remember, in the Old Testament ritual where the priest had two lambs and he laid his hands on one of them, imparting to them the sin of the congregation. And that one he sent out into the wilderness, and the other one was sacrificed. This is from a Greek verb, aphiemi, which means to send away. And because of what has happened to us in Jesus, God sends away our sins, sends them away. Uh, another explanation is that they are removed from the mind of God. The sins are removed from the mind of God. They're sent away completely so that they no longer exist. Uh, some of the passages are, are, are very clear. Psalm 103. And verse 12. One that we know well, but when you see the implications of it, it uh, brings it home to you. Psalm 103 and verse 12, page 522. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That far. Quite interesting. Uh, uh, one of the commentators says, you know, uh, not the north to the south. Not as far as the north is from the south, but as far as the east is from the west. Because the north to the south is a finite distance that is measurable. 
as far as the east <coughs> is from the west, it's uh, infinite. It's that far that God has sent away our sins. He's removed them absolutely and utterly, as if they never were, as if they never existed, never to be dragged up again. That's what forgiveness is. He sends them utterly and completely away. Uh, another uh, verse is Micah 7 and 19. And it's page 807. Micah 7 and 19, page 807. He will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Thou wilt cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's what forgiveness is. God casts our sins into the depths of the sea so that you cannot get them up again. And that's what Christ made possible for us on Calvary. That kind of absolute doing away with our sins so that even the memory of them is wiped out. So it's a complete and an absolute change, you know. It's something that God does in a complete way. With all our, uh, the forgiveness of our paraoptama, paraptoma, I think it is, para, paraptoma, P-A-R-A-P-T-O-M-A, and that's the word for trespasses. Tomo in je tom to tom il tom in French, you remember, is to fall, and so it's a falling off, a falling off, or a falling beside the way of right. It is. It's important for us to to be real about those because the forgiveness is uh, conditional upon our repentance. And our repentance, of course, is conditional upon us knowing what our trespass was. And it's important to see that a trespass, uh, so often we think of trespass, you know, in the legal sense of uh, trespassing upon somebody's property, but uh, trespass is actually a finer word than that. It's a falling. In fact, you can see that this uh, is the heart of the word, uh, uh, well, that's the geometric uh, symbol, I suppose, but it's the heart of the word parallel, you know. So it actually is interesting. It's just falling almost beside the road of right. You know? It's just falling off the road of right. Uh, it's in a way not plunging over a cliff. It's just falling to the side of it. And I think each of us know how easy it is just to step a little aside. Uh, I'm not just rejecting God, but I'm just stepping a little aside. I'm not disbelieving in him, but I'm believing just a little more in my own existence at this moment. That's what a trespass is. It's really, it has something of the meaning of the other word that is used for sin, hamarta, it is. Uh, it's, uh, it would be H-A-M-A-R-T-A. And it has the meaning uh, of uh, a, 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 an error, but it is an error, it's interesting, the translation is an error uh, in the intention of the heart. So a trespass has some of that, you know. It is not just murdering. It is not just cutting the person apart with a knife. It is an error in the intention of the heart. It's a, a living, really, as I suppose Bart would say, just living uh, as if you're on your own, <laughs> as if 
you're really, in a sense, as if you are your own. You know. And of course, that's where all our misery comes from, because our full joy comes from realizing that everything is Jesus Christ. Everything is our Lord Jesus Christ. For me to live is Christ. And then, of course, you're living on a holiday from yourself, and joy just flows over you. But when you live as if you're on your own, of course, there's a heaviness about you, and you're weighted down with the cares of this world and all the things you have to do. And so God is so gracious to us, you know. He gives us all kinds of signs that we're falling off the way. But uh, the, um, the great thing, of course, is that when we realize that and we turn from that and we say, no, we do not want that, Lord, then because of what Christ has done, God forgives us that trespass. He sends it as away as far as the east is from the, or the west. He casts it even into the depths of the sea. And that's the complete change that God brings about. And that's what is possible in Jesus. Because he has been, in a sense, both the victim and he has also been the judge on Calvary. He was God himself, taking from us the worst that we could give him. And he was also us, taking the full brunt of God's just wrath. And because of that, of course, we owe everything to our Savior.